Shalom, 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 greetings. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you all. Well, I can't actually see you, but uh, if you can see me, it's good to be seen. I am here this evening just for a brief moment to speak to you all, both the children of God and the children of everybody else. <laughs> okay? So go ahead and uh, like and share Spread the word. Let them know that uh, Apostle McNair is here. This is Apostle Clifton Lamont McNair. I am here with you for a brief moment to give you some good news. We're going to be talking on the subject of spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, this is for the hungry folk, those who are seeking, those who are hungry, passionate for the word of God, those who are seeking to go to higher levels and higher dimensions in the spirit of the Lord our God. And I'm here to facilitate and to help get you to where you need to be. I profess that I am not perfect. I am not a know-it-all. I don't know everything. I am not the be-all, end-all, do-all whatsoever. However... I am who I am by the grace of Yahweh, who sent me to you. Amen? All right. So, let's start off with prayer. And I'm going to be praying the Lord's Prayer, Yeshua's Prayer that he taught the disciples in the Aramaic tongue in which the Lord our Savior spoke. Abunda Basmaya Nithka Deshamak, Tete Malkutak, Newe Savianak, Akana Dabasmaya Afbara, Hawlan Lakmana Dasunkanan Yomana, Waspoklan Kaobain Waktukain, Akana Dafkan Shbokan Lakayobain, Willa Tashlan Lenishuna, Ella Pastan Minbisha, Metoda Laki Malkuta, Wahala Wateshbuta, La Alam Almin. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. For those of you who are just coming in, God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And I'm going to get all my greetings out now. If you're catching the replay, God bless your heart, bless your families. And I pray that you all are walking in faith, that you're walking in truth, that you're walking in the spirit of the Lord our God, that you're walking in victory, in healing, in safety, in provision, in peace. That is my prayer for you. The Lord bless you. God bless you. All right now, Elder Robert, I see you. Bless you. Bless you all. So let's get right down to it. We're talking about spirit, soul, and body. Yeah. Now, I'm going to put out a little disclaimer. Like I said, I'm going to be with you for a few, a few minutes. But my disclaimer to you is this. If you're expecting me to kind of get into a hoop or hollow or to go into some type of uh, trance or incantation or holy jerks and tongues and stuff like that, I'm sorry, that's not me. You might want to go catch somebody else's live, okay? We're going to get to some objective teaching, objective systematic teaching, and then whatsoever the Lord himself by the Spirit will speak through this vessel to you, all right? All right, so when we're talking about the spirit, soul, and body, we're talking about mankind's makeup, how we are made up in the image of Yahweh Elohim. Yeah, I know it sounds Trinitarian, and you all know that I'm not big on the Trinity, but I will convey to you that three is a divine number, all right? I'm not going to confine the Godhead to the number three as the Council of Nicaea and the Roman Empire did, you know, in the production of the Holy Bible that we now have today. But I will say that three is a divine number. And we are made in the image of Elohim, Yahweh. We are spirit, soul. And body. What exactly does that mean? We are tripartite beings, three parts. The Bible talks about how a threefold strand is not eagle, uh, easily broken, referring to marriage, referring to relationship, the God kind of relationship. So 
So what are we talking about when we're addressing the spirit and the soul and the body within an individual or a group of people? All right, let's read some scripture. All right, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And this is what the Bible has to say on this subject. All right, the New King James Version says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Thessalonians and their congregation. And here at the end of this particular chapter, he is giving them a benediction, a blessing. And it entails the maintenance and the keeping of our spirit, our soul, our body, the whole man. All right? We cannot be whole without one of the three, okay? So, again, in the King James Version reads, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. How in the world, how on God's green earth, can I, can you, can anyone be preserved blameless? I mean, our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, kept blameless until the Lord Yeshua comes back. We can't do it ourselves. There's no way. It is impossible. We're going to break down some words. Of course, you know, we're going to go through some Hebrew transliterations, okay? So we can further understand exactly what the scriptures are saying and how to apply those scriptures to our everyday lives. And also, how to encourage others, to build others, to give others knowledge, wisdom, and understanding on the subject of keeping our souls our spirits, our bodies, preserve blameless until the Lord comes back. How can it be done? We can't do it in and of ourselves. We don't have what it takes. We are flawed. We are imperfect. We are frail. We are made of dust, mud. Yahweh Elohim breathed his breath, his life, his essence into the nostrils of man. Man became a living consciousness. His soul came into being. His intelligence, his ability to reason and rationalize. rationalize all right? His ability to feel emotions. His ability to make decisions, to choose and to decide. That's the soul of man. And Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ came to the world so that our souls might be saved. It didn't say so that our spirits might be saved. It didn't say so that our bodies might be saved, but so that our soul might be saved. He came to save our mind. He came to save our decision-making ability. He came to bring salvation to our feelings, to our emotions. He came to deliver us from negative emotions, from mental disorders and mental illnesses. He came to deliver and to heal and to set us free from ignorance. Yes. He came to save our souls. All right? So, let's read the scripture one more time, shall we? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It reads, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify. Let's deal with that word. Sanctify. What exactly is sanctification. All right. 
I love going in chronological order as we're talking about spirit, soul, and body. But I have to go into the soul real quick because, you know, I'm going to skip over the spirit. We're going back to the spirit, okay? But the soul right here, we got we to gotta get it because that's the part of us that's going to live in eternity. That's the part of us that's going to decide. Matter of fact, our spirits are going to live in eternity as well. Our bodies will return back to the dust. Our soul and our spirit are the only two elements, only two parts of us that are going to <laughs> go to heaven. Now, that's if we're living right. That's if we're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. But if we're not saved, if we're not born again, for those of you who have not given your life to the Lord, then you have the responsibility and the power to make the decision to serve the Lord God and Yeshua or not. So if your decision is for the Lord Jesus, for Yeshua the Messiah, then guess what? Your soul is going to heaven as well as your spirit. And your body's going back to the dust. But if you do not make the decision to follow Yeshua, Jesus, to become born again, to live holy by his word, to be filled with his spirit, then your soul cannot be saved. Not without Yeshua. It can't be saved with Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon his name. It cannot be saved with Brahman. It cannot be saved with Confucius. It cannot be saved by any guru in the Indian world. It cannot be saved by anyone. Not by John Smith or Joseph Smith. It can't be saved by any archangel. It cannot be saved except through Yeshua and his sacrifice. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, woman, boy, or girl, no human, can get to the Father except through me. This is Yeshua talking, okay? So he's the way. Yeah, I know we're living in a world where so many uh, different cultures and religions have all these different gods and goddesses. And, you know... <laughs> You know, it's a dime a dozen. And I'm, I'm going to go through a few of them, okay, because I did a little research. Of course, you know, I'm always looking up something. But I did a little research on gods, okay? Now, we know being monotheistic, all right, believing in one supreme deity, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of creation, okay, creator of man, all right? We know that there is one God. That Yahweh is one. But guess what? In Egypt, now this now the countries, the lands that I'm gonna call out, this information applies to ancient world and the modern world. Okay? We're talking about gods. These different countries and nations and peoples and clans and tribes have different gods. It's not the God that we worship. Even though some of them are based on our God. But listen. Egypt. We're talking about numbers. Quantity. How many gods does Egypt have? How many gods, how many deities do they worship? And research says that there are over 2,000 gods of Egypt. 2,000. Ancient Babylon. Modern Babylon. Over 3,000 gods. Greece, 12 deities. Rome, 12 deities. Persia, 12 deities. Now, some of these numbers have been shortened because some of these places had other gods that they combined uh, with their gods from other cultures. South America, 62 gods. Native America, 217 deities that we know of. China, over 1,000 deities. Japan, 8 million gods that they worship. India, 33 million deities. Aztec, over 200 deities. Mayans, over 250 deities. 
the Nordic countries, Vikings, 12 deities, the oceanic peoples of the islands of the sea, Pacific, 217 gods, the Celtics, over 400 deities, Canaan, then and now, over 234 gods, Mesopotamia, over 3,000 gods, the Slavic countries, in the Balkans, nine deities, Polynesia, 16 gods, the Caribbean, 48 gods that we know of. Africa is the only landmass that the majority of the people worship one god. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah. Now, we do have Muslim nations uh, in Africa, and we have uh, Buddhist nations in Africa. We have other people, but for the most part, they believe in one god. All right. And they have inferior, inferior gods. Uh, they have ancestral spirits that they worship and goddesses. All right. And of course, you know that the three main or the three major religions of the world today, Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Now, why did I go through all these gods and all these nations? Because I'm going to ask you a question. The subject being spirit, soul, and body. The same way all these peoples from all these different lands and cultures believe that all these gods and deities, goddesses, could help them maximize their life on earth and to achieve life eternal in the next life, what was it that those gods had to offer? Why so many gods? Because in the ancient world, they believed that for every person, there is a god. <laughs> That's just how they thought. Okay? So, in other words, for as many as there are people, there are as many gods to worship. But we know that there is only one. Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh Echad, the Lord our God. Yahweh is one. He's one. But your Bible says that there are three persons. That operate as one person. Okay. Now as you know. I'll repeat it. That I'm not big on the Trinity. Because I have found. That some of those nations. That I mentioned to you earlier. Also had their own Trinity. So the Christian religion. Uh, basically adopted. Some of the same Godhead structures. That were in ancient Babylon ancient Canaan, ancient Egypt, okay? So we do know that the Lord identifies himself in Scripture through the number four, okay? That's the number of the world, north, south, east, west, okay? The four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the earth, the four seasons, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. Yeah. So we know that looking at what we have dealing with being blameless, it says, and the very God of peace sanctify you. That means to be sanctified means to be set apart. Now, the word for sanctified in the Hebrew is kadash or kadosh. All right. Now, kadash means set apart. That means that there's, there is a specific purpose for what is being set apart. Okay? There's a specific purpose. All right? This thing is being set on the shelf, being placed in a safe area 
to be used later at the appointed time. So we need to be set apart. The Bible tells us many times in so many different scriptures to come out from among them and be ye separate. You know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You know, for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these things are of the world. They're not of the Father. And if you love these things, the love of the Father is not in you. Okay, so that means to come out, to be set apart, to step back, to be different. So for those of you uh, clergy members or non-clergy members, if you are born again, and just about every week you're having an existential crisis and you're trying to prove to everybody who God created you to be and how you are not like everybody else. Well, newsflash, you were made to be different. We were made to be different. We were not made to all be the same and to function like the next person. So whoever receives us or does not receive us, whoever hears us or chooses not to hear us, whoever uh, embraces us or chooses to reject us, that's not our problem, is it? It shouldn't be. It should not be. Okay, so uh, the Lord is, is really, really bringing uh, a hard wood to some of your backsides because... Some of you, as old as you are, not in number, not in age, but in the ministry, in the gospel, you're still sounding like a, a toddler, a spiritual toddler. Some of you are still acting and sounding like children. And the scriptures tell us, point blank, in the spirit and in the word, I would that you not be children, but be men, be grownups, be adults. And there's a certain way that we carry ourselves that is different, that is distinctive, different from those, not, not saying that we're better because we're not. Nobody's better. Nobody has arrived. Okay? We, we got to get that straight. There's nobody perfect. But is it possible? Is it possible? God bless you, Brother Greg. Is it possible? To live a holy life to the point where you are totally irrecognizable to the world. And to some people who say that they are saints. Yeah, it's possible. There is a level of holiness. There's a level of sanctification. There's a level of set-apartness that individuals can reach where they are actually walking, talking, and thinking alongside God. That's where I've been trying to bring you guys for the past several years. Okay, look, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. But there is a level of anointing, a level of knowledge that the Lord has bestowed upon me that I am commissioned to bring to you guys and gals. Some of you are great students. Some of us are just hard-headed. Some of us are just rebellious. Some of us just want to do what we're going to do. Some of us are goats. Can I talk to you goats out there? Because you're eating up everything you see. You're eating from everybody's table. You find this prophet. You, you find that prophet. You're circulating this prophet in the inbox. Look, don't send me another prophet in my inbox, please. Okay, I'm open to other ministry gifts. Yes, I can recognize that. I realize some of you do it to bounce it off of me to see if I approve. That's fine. But I'm telling you, there are too many voices in some of your ears. And you don't know exactly what you're doing. You think you're making the right decision based on what you heard certain ministry gifts say. I'm trying to tell you. Hey, Aunt Brenda. Yes, I'm trying to tell you. That there are voices that are not voices of truth. They're not speaking from the Spirit of God. They're speaking from head knowledge. They're speaking from their souls, from their emotions, from their feelings. They're speaking from what they heard. And they're always 
feeling for information. They got their antennas and their feelers out just floating in the wind and whatever passes by, they're getting it and drawing and soaking and absorbing. Who told you to do that? Did God tell you to do that? I doubt it. That's not how we do, especially ministry gifts. Some of y'all been in the ministry for 75 years and you still ain't got it right. I'm just being honest. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm being honest. Speaking by the Spirit of the Lord, God wants us to be like Him. Yeshua was the example. Everybody should be sounding like Jesus. Everybody should be living his lifestyle. Everybody should be teaching his parables. Everybody should be preaching his gospel. Everybody should be loving the way he loved. Everyone should show the mercy that he showed everybody else. Yeah, it's true. But we talk more about ourselves than we do anything or anybody else. We are ministering about our own emotional traumas. We're ministering about our own testimonies. And then it's good to testify. Okay? Testimony has its place. But not during the delivery of the word of God. Can I say that one more time? When you're preaching and teaching, I don't know where, what school you went to. I don't know what seminary you went to. I don't know what college you matriculated through as far as uh, theology or biblical studies. But when you're dealing with homiletics and hermeneutics, when you're bringing forth the word of God, that is no time for us to get on a soapbox about our own individual life. We're supposed to be talking about the life of Yahshua, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah of Nazareth. It's supposed to be all about him. But we've made, we've made it about us. We're making it about us. It shouldn't be about us. Ministry is not about an individual person. It is not about a personality. It is not about your pastor, your apostle, your bishop, your doctor. It is not about anybody except the one who came to die on the cross, who shed his blood at Galgotha's Hill. His name is Yeshua, the Messiah of Nazareth. He is the one that we're supposed to be uplifting honoring, obeying, walking with, quoting. <laughs> but we'll quote our favorite apostle and prophet before we'll quote the scriptures that Jesus spoke. We'll quote everybody else before we quote Jesus. Why? Because now Jesus is boring. Now we've heard enough of Jesus. Oh yeah, we know about Jesus. We know it back and forth. We know it with our eyes closed. But are you living it? Yeah, we know it. We hear it. But are we doing it? We're not supposed to be hearers of the word only, but doers, meaning we are little messiahs walking this earth, bringing salvation to people in our sphere of influence. We are messiahs. If you are born of the water and of the spirit, if you are filled with Rucha Kadesh, you are a Messiah to somebody or to some group of people in this earth. You are a Messiah. <laughs> so why is it so hard for us to wrap our head around that fact? Why do we feel like that's blasphemy or it's sacrilegious to say that we are messiahs. Because you're steeped in religion. You're soaked in it. You're marinated in it. It's ingrained in you. And it's got to be broken off you in order for you to get the manifestation of who God made you and I to be. We are messiahs. Yes, we are. And it behooves us to make sure that we are set apart like the Messiah was. All right. Again, Kadash, Kadosh means to be sanctified, to be set apart. Blameless until the coming of the Lord. Blameless. What is that word? Tamin in Hebrew. Tamin. What does Tamin mean? Blameless. 
It means that we are sincere. It means that we are perfect. It means that we are spot free, wrinkle free. That's what Tamin is. Are you Tamin? Are you Tamin? Blameless, set apart. Are you perfect? Uh, but nobody's perfect. See, in the Hebrew language, the word perfect does not mean without sin. See, this English translation, our Western evangelical Christianity has shown his head again and has misled us by words. We need to learn some definition. We need to go, we need to go back to the Hebrew language and learn the scriptures. In the Bible, the word perfect in the context that is being used as far as be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect, or be ye perfect for I am perfect. It does not mean that you are necessarily sin free, although Yahshua was. It means that we being filled with the Holy Spirit, being consciously set apart by our own decision, okay, being fully and sincerely repentant and having received the spirit of the Messiah on the inside of us, who is the kingdom, Shemaim, all right? Now, we have the unlimited power to live abundantly on earth because everything that pertains to life and godliness was given unto us through the spirit. Of Yahshua the Messiah. So be perfect. That means be blameless. Tamin. Okay, yeah, the Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We know that. We got to repent daily. We got to re repent every moment. Okay? All right? Don't just wait till you get home because you might not make it home. All right? Repent when it happens. Repent when you think it. Repent when you say it. Right then. Because anything could happen and you might not make it to, to, to your house to get on your knees. Now, I'm talking to somebody. So, let us remember the scriptures. Paul is telling the church at Thessalonians at the end of this chapter. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you. Holy means separate you, set you apart. Holy set you apart. How? What does this holy mean? W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy. It means that he prays that our spirit, he says our whole spirit, not a quarter, not half, not three quarters, but our whole spirit, our whole soul, and our whole body be preserved, be kept Blameless, tamin, wrinkle free, spot free, until the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. All right. Now, when we talk about spirit, and I'm almost done, the Hebrew word for spirit, Aramaic, is rucha. Okay? Rucha. And the Hebrew is ruach, all right? And the term rucha kodesh or ruach hakodesh is the Holy Spirit. And what exactly is our spirit? That is the God space in us. That is God in us. That is the breath of life. That is what some call our life force. That is what some others call our chi. It's God. It's the Almighty's breath in our bodies. His life, His essence in us that causes us to want to connect to Him always. That feeling the need to worship and to be connected to someone greater than ourselves. That is the spirit. That's the rucha. That's the ruach, kakodesh, the spirit. So you see, when a man dies, a righteous man, let's do with the righteous. When a righteous man dies, his spirit instantly returns back to God who gave it to him. 
which is the breath of life that he breathed into his nostrils and became a living consciousness. That spirit, that essence, that life force returns back to the source. Now the body, when a man dies, and this is for all men, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, the body goes back to the dust from whence it came. Yes, it goes back, it deteriorates, Worms and all type of bugs and stuff uh, begin to feast on the corpse. All right, if you you know being burned, cremated, then you, you're a pile of ashes. But either way, you're returning back to the dust. Now, the word for body is gawia. All right, gawia is the body. Gawia is Hebrew for body. Or corpse uh, or avatar okay this part of us has got to remain blameless now when you get saved your spirit is automatically saved I mean it becomes like brand new you're reborn spiritually you are reborn literally all right your spirit is reborn your body <laughs> your body's not saved okay Although you may feel sensations in your body, your body's not saved, okay? That's something that we have to work on every single day, okay? Your body will never be saved, okay? That's why the body has got to go back to the dust because there's no salvation for this, none. But the soul, the nefesh in Hebrew, nefesh, spirit, Soul, mind, body. The soul is the ability to reason, to rationalize, to think, intelligence, uh, uh, feelings, emotions. Okay? Your perspective. Creative ability. That's nefesh. That's the only part of us that we have the responsibility and the power to decide where it's going, to decide the eternal disposition, whether it's in heaven with the Lord or in hell. That's the only part of us that we get to decide. All right? We get to choose. Angels can't choose. They were created to worship God. They were created to take orders. They were created to execute. So there's really no volition, no, no, no self-will. But their will is God's will. Their mind is God's mind. They want to be like us. Angels long to look into the things concerning redemption. You know, the soul buyback plan. Through the blood of Yahshua. They have no idea. No clue what that's about. Because they were made perfect. But we. Human beings. We. Who have decided. To serve the Lord our God. The God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. The one true God. The one true living Elohim. Whose name is Yahweh. Some call him Yahuwah. Some call him Yahawashi. It don't matter what you call him. And that's another thing, Hebrew Israelites. You need to get off this thing about names and how you pronounce it. As long as you're not calling him Jehovah, as long as you're not calling him, you know, some other crazy name that has no bearing on who he is, you're fine. Use the Y names. Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahawashi, Yahawah. It's all God because Y-A-H, Yah, is the most powerful name in the universe. Yah. Even if you call uh, Jesus Yeshua, Y-E-S-H-A, or S-H-U-A, Yeshua. And you know, the modern, the modern linguistics, they say that that was Jesus' name in Aramaic. Okay, whatever. But, you know, that's fine. That's fine. If you want to say Yeshua, say Yeshua. That's fine. 
If you want to say Yahshua, that's fine. You want to say Yahawashi? Go ahead. Because I'm, if you want to say Ishu or Isho, it's Jesus. You know, and then if you and if you call him Jesus, I'm not telling you you're wrong. Okay? Call him whatever you want to call him. Because when the, when the rubber meets the road, when it all boils down to it, it's about your relationship. And it's about who you know him to be in your life. Who he is to you, what he's done for you personally, and what you are committed to doing for him. As long as it's the same Yeshua, the same Messiah that was in Palestine a little over 2,000 years ago, who was born during the month of Tishri, which is mid-September to mid-October, during this season right now, this season, while I yet speak with you, Yahshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, was born during this time. Okay? What does it have to do with anything? What does it have to do with your whole spirit, soul, and body? Because if we are not worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, guess what? Everything we're doing and saying and going now, it's all in vain. Yeah, I know it feels good. I know it sounds good. Sounds powerful. Oh, man, that looks like kingdom. Oh, God, that is, ooh, just blew my mind. Oh, that's powerful, fresh. Oh, my God, listen to that word, that revelation, that prophecy. Oh, my God. Look, I don't care if your name and your face and your church, your ministry is on a flyer every single week. I don't care if your itinerary is booked to next year this time dealing with ministry and preaching and teaching. But guess what? If our whole spirit, soul, and body is not preserved blameless, it's not set apart, it's not sanctified, We're going to get before the Lord and we're going to say, Lord, Lord, wait a minute. I did this. I went here. I went there. I built this. I built that. I taught these people. I preached here and I preached this. All for you, God, all in your name. I prophesied it came to pass. I laid my hands on the sick. They recovered. I went to the hospital. People got healed. And the Lord is going to say, Depart from me. I never knew you. You, workers of iniquity, prepare for the devil and his angels. Why would he say that to church folk? Why would he tell somebody who did voted their whole entire lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would he say to them, I never knew you? We knew church, but we didn't know him. We knew church operation. We knew how to run a service. We knew how to to raise money. We knew how to put on a program and to conduct seminars and to conduct conferences and, and, and workshops. We knew the church business. We knew how to run the building. But we didn't really know the Savior who supersedes all buildings. The Savior who came to destroy the building, to put his kingdom, his Malkuta, on the inside of you and me. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, it tells us, he was talking to the Pharisees, he was talking to these learned men, asking, when is the kingdom of God is going, when is the kingdom of God going to come? Jesus. Yeshua, when is it coming? Are you the one? 
Just like some of y'all preachers. Some of y'all get on my nerves. Some of y'all I want to jack up and just smack. In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. And I love you. I pray for your healing when I'm done. But really, you know, all jokes aside, I just, it, it perturbs me. It gets, it irks me to no end. When I hear and I see people who should know better, people who've been in church their entire lives or for the majority of their lives, people who've been leading people, who've been heads of ministry, who are still failing at this point. And what is that point? We are the ones that Yeshua spoke about when he said, you wicked and perverse generation who seeketh after a sign. You're looking, searching for signs wonders and miracles you call them fruit you who are looking and spying on other believers or minister gifts conducting your own clandestine inspection trying to see whether or not they're producing fruit and how good is their fruit is their fruit going to remain is it God's fruit well, let me tell you what the Lord Yeshua told them back then. You wicked and perverse generation. I don't care if you are a so-called doctor, apostle, bishop, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, elder, minister. If you are one of those who are looking after signs, who are looking for signs, winners, and miracles, who are looking for fruit. You're looking for the evidence of power in the lives of people to judge whether or not they are coming from God. Let me reiterate what Yeshua said to those in his day. You wicked and perverse generation who seeketh after a sign. The Hebrew word for sign is ot. It means omen. It means a standard, a witness. To express assent. Communicate silence. That's what ot means. Okay? That's what sign is. And signs and gifts are companions. Signs are produced from the gift okay wonders the Hebrew word for that is tama tama that's wonders what is wonders it means amazement astonishment shocking astounding amazing something that cannot be explained Wonders are gifts, or wonders and gifts, wonders and gifts are companions. Wonders follow gifts. Wonders follow gifts, and they are produced from gifts. Okay? Miracles. What is the Hebrew word for miracles? Miracles. There is no Hebrew word for miracles. There is no word to comprehend what a miracle is in scripture. But let's see what it says. It does not occur in the, orig in the original text. Miracle in the Latin for miracle is miraculum. Okay, meaning an object of wonder. Something that amazes people. Okay, the Greek word is dunamis or dunamis. Meaning dynamic or dynamite, explosive. All right? Uh, and another uh, word, Greek, 
word for sign is semion. Another Greek word for sign is teras. Okay? And another Hebrew word for a display of God's power or sign or amazement that is unfathomable or unexplainable to men is malfeth. Malfeth. Unexplainable, unfathomable, divine manifestation beyond human ability and comprehension. That is what we call a miracle. So, yes... We who follow Yeshua signs, wonders, and miracles are going to follow us too. Why? Because as He is the vine, we are the branches, and God is the vine dresser. As long as we are connected to the vine, we have no choice but to bear fruit. Okay? As long as we are connected to Yeshua, meaning that we abide in him and his word abide in us, we're going to produce fruit. Now, what fruit? This is where you've gotten it mixed up, church folk and preachers. You are talking about looking at fruit from people when you're confusing fruit with gifts. Okay, now let me understand. Let me tell you something about gifts. The gifts of the spirit are for the edification, the exhortation and comfort of the body of Messiah. You can't eat gifts. You cannot digest gifts. <laughs> but you can eat fruit. I'm the word of the fruit of the Spirit. Huh? The fruit of the Spirit are listed in Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faith, humility, and patience. And on these things, no law is placed. Okay? There's no law against any of those. Okay? So, let's stop being so busy being on the lookout or being <laughs> Negro scared. <laughs> I mean, I had to say that because a lot of us, my God, we act like some scared Negro on a plantation and we just looking out for Massa, hoping he don't come around the corner, hoping we're scared. And we are the most skeptical people. And we're always bringing some type of warning about a person to everybody else. You better watch out for that one or look out for that one. Over no, what about you? What about the person in the mirror? Because if you come to me warning me about somebody, guess what? I'm, my eyes are going to be on you. Not the person you're telling me about. I'm watching you because the same way you're warning somebody or uh, warning me about somebody else, you're doing the same thing to me. We got to be set apart. All that activity falls in line with tail bearing, gossiping, and backbiting. In the name of Jesus. But the Lord said, I would, through Paul, he told the Thessalonians, he said, and the very God of peace, sanctify you, set you apart. But God is not going to set you apart until you want to be set apart. Now, I'm going to brush on this real quick and I'm going to get off of it. I'm not here to force anybody's hand. I'm not here to twist your arm. I'm not here to say that everybody else is wrong and I'm right. No, that is not the case. My purpose for being here is to bring you the light, to bring you the truth in the spirit of truth. And you do with it what you will. It's out of my hands. The ball's in your court now. But you can never stand before God and say that nobody told you. You can never stand before God at the end of time and say that you didn't know or you never heard it before. If you've heard me, you've heard it. What you decide to do with it is up to you. Okay? So, with all that being said, I'm going to go. And my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we all, 
be sanctified, holy, and that our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, be kept blameless until the coming of the Lord. And the Lord is coming back. All right, that's another teaching for another day. But Yeshua is coming back. We're living in a time where men are not, they're not tolerating or enduring sound doctrine, groundational teaching, but have been drawn away by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, having itching ears to hear only those that they like, <laughs> having itching ears to hear and receive from only those that they agree with, having itching ears to hear from their favorite ministry gifts to hear things that they want to hear. Things that they feel that they need to hear. The Lord wants us to be ready. And I've been here for the past several years uh, trying to accomplish what the Lord has given to my hands as it pertains to ministry and preparing his people for the coming of the Lord Yeshua. We're in a global pandemic, people. I want to touch on this for a minute. God bless you, Carlos. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. But I'm going to talk about this pandemic for a minute. Not a long, drawn-out thing. We're in a global pandemic. So, regardless of whether you choose or have chosen to receive the COVID vaccination, I'm not going to tell you not to get it. I'm not going to tell you you need to get it. If you ask me, have I gotten it or will I get it? Let me tell you this. Do you remember the Garden of Eden? When the serpent beguiled Eve and tricked her into eating or biting that fruit? And instantly, you know, she just lost all glory. You know, she just died spiritually. So I can imagine that to Adam, before he bit the fruit, Eve didn't look right. She wasn't the same. She changed. She wasn't alive anymore. Not eternally, as she was before. So one of the things that a lot of people don't touch on when they preach this message, when they teach from this text, is that Adam had a decision to make. He knew what the Lord told him. He knew. Don't touch that fruit. Don't eat it. Lest you die. But when he saw the person that he's been waiting for his whole life, the person that he prayed to God about, that he needed a help meet, you know, a mate, just like all the other animals in the, in the animal kingdom, they all had mates. He didn't have anything, but God made him one, took a rib out and formed Eve and brought him or brought her unto the man, man with a womb, womb man. But she changed. She died. She looked different. She wasn't, functioning at the same level. He couldn't reach her. He couldn't connect with her like he wanted because he was still in a glorified state and she was spiritually dead. So one of the reasons why he took a bite of that fruit was not to become wise as God like 
Eve did. That was the purpose for her biting the fruit. But I believe within my heart and spirit that Adam took a bite because he loved Eve so much. He could not leave her out there by herself in that state. So he joined her. He joined her. I went all the way around Jerusalem just to come back to say this. My wife is a registered nurse. She worked in the COVID clinic when it first came out for the first two or three months, hands on, face to face, all day, every day. We had to take so many extra precautions. When she came home, she had to undress in the garage and put her clothes in a bag before she even came into the house. So she protected me. She looked out for me, for the house. She didn't want to infect me, let alone herself. And then it became a requirement for her, working in that setting on the front lines, to get the vaccine. And she got the vaccine, both shots, Moderna. And I heard all the rumors, I heard all the propaganda about the vaccine, you know, they got the chip in there, the mark of the beast, or uh, it's made with something that's going to kill you in two years, and what a, all this stuff. You know what? I decided if my wife can get vaccinated and if she's going to be put at risk, then I'm not going to leave her out there by herself either. I'm going to get the vaccine. So I got it. Both shots. Moderna. And guess what? Neither Tanya nor I have ever to this day been tested positive for COVID-19. It wasn't because of the vaccination, so to speak. It may have helped. It wasn't so much that we pled the blood of Jesus. We pleaded the blood of Jesus and and just covered our house and, you know, with the anointing and the power and the spirit of God. I know a lot of y'all want to go that route, but no. I mean, yeah, I believe that has something to do with it. I'm not ruling it all out, but Tanya and I made the decision. To not go see mom and them. Tanya and I made the decision. That we're we're not going to go and visit. Our in-laws or our sisters and brothers. Nieces and nephews. Yeah. People thought we were kind of standoffish and antisocial. You know. But guess what? We're in the middle of a doggone pandemic people. And we're still hard-headed. We're still out here looking for an excuse to get out or to to mingle. (laughs) Listen. You can't expect me to feel sorry for you. And you can't come to me asking me to pray for something that you and yourself Open yourself up to you. Let you open the door and let it into your house when you could have just said no, not right now. Yeah, I know we're trying to get back to normalcy and, and you know, we're trying to get back to the regular way of doing things. We want to mingle, we want to go out. We've we, we, we've grown, you know, frustrated. We got cabin fever, we're tired of being shut down, locked up. We have to do what we have to do. If we want to stay alive, people. And if we don't want to run the risk of jeopardizing somebody else's life. And guess what? Soon after uh, my wife got her vaccination, you know, my job at IBM, they started uh, asking questions. Every time I come to work, McNair, did you get your uh, vaccine yet? I'm like, why? None of your business. (laughs) Mind your business. But, uh... Yeah, now it's mandated. We don't even really have a whole campus of people, people working from home. So if we got people at these big corporations and industries and they are their managers, their CEOs, CFOs have made the decision to have half or three quarters of their whole corporation work from home because of the pandemic. Why are some of you hard-headed, ignorant, careless, 
shepherds of the flock of God still forcing people to come to your building? Why? 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 Is that how much you love the sheep? Is that how much you care for the sheep? When we have Facebook Live, we have Zoom, we have rooms in these groups on Facebook, we have Google, we have all these different venues to keep in contact, to stay connected, to be face to face, although not physical, but virtually connected and staying safe. Using wisdom. And some of you say, well, that's a lack of faith. You don't trust God. I'm not going to test God. I trust God. I'm not going to test God. Okay? So, with that being said, do what you got to do. All right? Uh, For those of you who want to join me, I am going into the wilderness again. You know, every time I go into the wilderness, I'm, you know, putting away this, putting away that. I'm, I'm abstaining from this or that. So you, you've all known me enough. If, you know, if you have any questions about what the wilderness entails, all you got to do is go to my timeline, go to the search bar and type in wilderness. If you're in the way, go to the search bar, type in wilderness. And you can see all the posts. It tells you exactly what the wilderness is, is about. But, um, yeah, going to the wilderness Um, October 1st through the 9th, okay? Uh, If you're willing to join, you're you're welcome, all right? And uh, some of us don't feel that this is the time to uh, put away food, and I can respect that for some of you who may be exposed uh, to COVID-19 or you have comorbidities that uh, may damage or slow down your immune system, do what you got to do, whatever works for you. But I'm telling you, okay, like no other, this is the time to draw closer to the Lord in the wilderness. You can do what you want. I don't care. But this is the time. Food, the abstinence of food is not the only thing that we put away in the wilderness. So if you look at the wilderness of being as being without food, if that's your biggest problem, you've missed the whole point altogether. Okay? Because it's not just going without food, it's going it's going without certain foods. Okay? We're not eating red meat. We're not eating meat at all. We're eating greens and we're eating them fresh or lightly steamed. And we're incorporating a few nuts in there too. Okay? Uh and that's it, you know, that's it. If you want to eat, you know, some fruit, that's fine. But uh, we're not doing meat. We're not doing uh, sugar, cakes, cookies, junk food, chips, sodas, all that stuff. We're drinking water, 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 and only water. No tea, no coffee, water. No flavored water, water. Now, caveat, if you want to put some lemon in your water, by all means. Lemon water is good. That's fine. But anyway, that's what we're doing. And so I pray that uh, you all are living your best life. I pray that you are being safe, being smart. Okay? Be smart. Now, I know we got some old saints that you just, you're not going to change. Then some of y'all are old and set in your ways, and you're not going to change. You're going to keep doing what you've been doing, what you say have been working for you over the past 89 years, and you're not going to change. And now to people like you, can God really, (laughs) can he afford to give you fresh revelation knowledge? No. (laughs) Really. (laughs) He can't because you're not going to change. You're not open to God's new thing. He said, I'm doing a new thing. You pray for your new thing. You pray that God will bring a manifestation of his word, his spirit, his truth. It came to you and you smacked it away. And you're still doing it. Nevertheless, Yahweh bless you and keep you. 
Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. I love you. May heaven smile upon you. Shalom.